maybe I'll just start out by sort of elaborating a bit more on some of this background of who's this person sitting here? What was my journey to sort of shift from military to studying climate science? And um, how have I tried to participate in, in putting a voice out there on this nexus or intersection between militarism and climate uh, specifically? So I. I went to West Point, but I grew up in Massachusetts. You know, from the age of 17, I joined the military. It was, I graduated high school in 2003, which is about as um, jingoistic or nationalistic a time as you could be in terms of blind faith and nationalism in, in recent American history. And, uh, you know, at that age, I knew a few things. Number one, I knew I couldn't pay for college. Uh, and that my family didn't have money for me to uh, attend college on their dime. So I was gonna have to find my own way. Number two, uh, I sort of believe that military service is an absolute good. You know, you're raised as a child on a diet of stories that the US, no matter what they do, um, it, it's always a good thing to serve. Um, only later, as I learned, it's, not true and that it's actually extremely patriotic to question that premise about military service being an absolute good and one of the analogies that i often use that seems to resonate with folks is that no other public service career um, would have the same sort of effects in the sense that if you devoted your life to being a teacher and you became better at teaching you could go to sleep fairly soundly knowing that the community and the kids you teach are probably better off. The same thing could be said about being a firefighter. If you're really good at being a firefighter, presumably, you know, things are, things are better for your, your community. But being in the military, because it is not about construction or risk prevention, it is about destruction. Um, it does not mean it's an absolute good uh, to be serving in the military because it highly depends on what the war is that you're gonna go fight. And one of the main things in American culture is to push out of view uh, any thoughts about what is the war that you're trying to fight, that you, you don't ask a lot of these questions that are upstream saying, why are we doing this? How does this actually uh, relate to defending Americans at home? What are gonna be the externalities on the people that are living there? Is this morally justified? Is it justified in terms of international law? Um, you know, what sort of precedent ethically and morally do we set as a country? Uh, and, and what sort of impairments to our own national reputation globally might we have by intervening in a conflict? So those are all things that I never really was thinking about when I was 17 and thinking about uh, joining the military. And, you know, aside from the two things I just mentioned, you know, three is I, I was, athletic and really loved this idea of character building and personal development that you were not necessarily going to get taught formally as they do in a West Point curriculum at a civilian university. And so I, I applied and was very grateful to have gotten in. And uh, my, my path sort of continued down that same route that once you get to West Point, uh, you start stacking yourself amongst your, your classmates and the most American thing you can do, or the most, um, not, not the most sexy thing you can do, but like the, the best thing that you could possibly do for service for your country is to be as close to combat as possible. That it was almost seen as a scarlet letter or shirking your duty, uh, to be picking a support role because you're in the back. The, the real Americans actually confront the enemies of America in close combat and fight them. And you don't see around West Point any buildings named after the supply and logistics officer. Uh, they are named after combatant commanders. Uh, no one in uh, Signal <laughs> is, is, is getting a statue or a, a time uh, article written about them. It is about combatant commanders moving armor and infantry and field artillery units and aviation assets uh, around the engagement area. So like it is culturally quite ingrained. And so for me as well, 
being the type A competitive person that I am, you know, pursued that route wholeheartedly. And I branched infantry. I went to ranger school and um, reconnaissance school. I attended and passed special forces selection when I was 19. And I saw this life coming uh, ahead of me of becoming one day, dreaming of being a detachment commander in the Green Berets and um, doing great work. And that's sort of what I saw. And in many ways, West Point's a bit insulated from that. Um, in terms of sort of pedagogy, you are being taught by an older version of yourself because the people who teach you are those that often graduated from West Point and lived a very siloed, channeled life where they did the same military training, they did the same military schoolings, they did the same deployments, they go to the same graduate schools, and then they come back and recycle those same thoughts at the academy over and over again. Um, and, and so in, in many ways, one could say that that's in some ways brainwashing. Uh, and, and I had a very particular view of the world that was extremely positive about uh, the use of political violence in other countries and the belief that if I were guided by great values, I could do the right thing, that it doesn't matter what war you're in. If you as an individual are leading um, you know, on a moral compass that points to true north, that your service is good. And I believe that, uh, at least until I got to Afghanistan. And so my, my time proceeded where you know, I became a uh, platoon leader in Kandahar, Afghanistan, where about 25% of my platoon I originally deployed with became casualties during that year-long deployment. And they became casualties in lots of different ways. I did not make it through the first week of my tour in Kandahar before uh, a vehicle was hit by a uh, anti-personnel mine linked to homemade explosives, and it completely ripped apart my squad leader's vehicle, tossed the engine block, um, you know, quite far away, tires going 100 meters away, and and were evacuating four of my soldiers before the outgoing unit had even left. And so you think about it and you realize, okay, this is one week down and I've lost four guys that are now injured and out of the, the tour. I didn't know how seriously injured they were and whether they would be permanently handicapped, whether they would have traumatic brain injuries. Uh, and, and so I, I was unclear like what this year was gonna look like. If that's one week down, um, that is a pretty ominous view. And so, Throughout that deployment, I started to realize as the U.S. was shooting a school, not a school bus, but basically a passenger bus uh, full of machine gun rounds by the Arkansas National Guard because they were driving too close to the U.S. convoy and the presumably very frightened 19-year-old private or whoever is in the back of the convoy feels, feels threatened. Uh, and they shoot this bus up killing, you know, something like three or five people and injuring uh, double digits of others, uh, you could understand the legitimate grievances and anger that Afghans had for us being in their country. And I knew after a certain amount of time that no matter what I did as an individual, I was an occupier. And that the things that our country was doing to the people of Afghanistan uh, is unquestionably state terrorism. Because if you did the same thing to us, uh, if you had a drone strike hit a wedding in Maine, uh, what would you call it? By a foreign country or uh, maybe a, a, a group? Well, it would probably be considered terrorism. If they were targeting uh, you know, people in the CIA, the FBI, and, and the military, and maybe policymakers who were voting the wrong way that they didn't like, and, and they're being targeted for assassination either by drone or by uh, raids, we would probably call it terrorism. If Americans were being held in black sites for being tortured or held in a Guantanamo equivalent, um, we would probably call that terrorism. But we do that to other countries and we are willing to destroy far more for far less as a country.
And so I started to realize that while I was there and it was a pretty rude awakening. And um, about nine months in, I uh, received my sort of email from uh, like basically the, the special forces branch in Fort Bragg, North Carolina saying, hey, your packet's been accepted. You've already gone through selection. When you finish this deployment, you'll report down back to uh, Fort Bragg. You'll no longer be classified as an infantry officer. And you know you can begin the rest of the Q course. And to me, this was the dream I had for many years. It, this was the culmination of uh, many years of hard work at West Point and chasing a dream that others thought was right and that I thought was right for, for quite a long time. And having seen what I, what I saw in, and witnessed in Afghanistan, it took me about 15 minutes to think about that and then respond quite curtly that this is something I'm no longer interested in and I'm looking to exit the military as soon as I possibly can when my contract is over. And so, you know, I, I left the military in 2012 as a captain um, after being in the Honor Guard in DC. And I thought about what I wanted to do next. And, you know, I had been during that sort of period of time, I think it came out in 2006 or something, 2005, An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. And it start, that was the first thing that got me thinking more seriously about what is this whole climate change thing? How serious is it? And, uh, you know, maybe I should devote some of my time, energy, and assets to learning more about this and having some sort of an impact. And uh, I went to graduate school in the UK and did an MBA and also a master of science where I studied climate change, specifically stranded assets, which are uh, things that you could think of that suffer from a premature write down or devaluation because the world doesn't understand climate change very well, at least certainly hasn't in the last several decades. Um, and basically like things that are at much greater risk than we may think or what would be popularly considered um, risky. And from, from that point, I uh, worked in the private sector in consulting and spent a lot of time thinking about my experience in Afghanistan and I knew I wanted to write about it. And I knew that I wanted to have a climate lens in the book. The editors and, and the publishing house wasn't actually sure whether that was a good idea. And, um, you know, like, is this a book about a soldier's experience in war and sort of having a um, first person primary source perspective on what it is to be in combat? Or is this about policy and lots of other stuff? And I felt that I wanted to make a very conscious decision in writing that book that I didn't want to say that the war is. Um, wrong, uh, immoral, and uh, you know, a huge waste of our country's assets and devastating to the people of Afghanistan. Um, I also wanted to take a stand on, and say, and, and take a perspective on what we should be focusing on instead. And so I, I put a lens looking at uh, the climate crisis. And so I'll read just a, a couple paragraphs from that excerpt from the book. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the article that I penned with Colonel Larry Wilkerson and uh, retired Major General Dennis Leitch uh, earlier this spring. And so what I mean by uh, climate action as patriotism. So here it goes. Since the Industrial Revolution, the United States is the world's leading contributor to climate change, emitting more carbon dioxide than the next three countries combined, China, Russia, and Germany. This measure of total emissions, rather than only looking at present day emissions, is the measure to use when allocating culpability because gases like carbon dioxide do not dissipate for thousands of years. On the topic of climate change, the United States has de demonstrated willful ignorance and active resistance, leaving a soiled legacy for future generations. Our government's response to the climate crisis amounts to environmental blitzkrieg waged against those least capable of defending themselves, other species, the poor, and unborn generations. 
Although American citizens may not expect perfection from our political leaders, we do expect a level of stewardship greater than complete and utter incompetence. Unfortunately, US policymakers cannot clear this low bar on the urgent topic of climate. The Climate Change Performance Index compiled by the Climate Action Network ranks countries for their actions on climate change, including their climate policies, energy use, and greenhouse gas emissions. Of the 60 countries measured, the United States and Saudi Arabia are 59th and 60th, respectively, on the list. As such, the effects of climate change continue to worsen. Leading organizations have become more urgent in their warnings. It makes you wonder, is there a worse crime, a worse crime than willfully and deliberately undermining organized life on this planet? And make no mistake, every dollar that America invests in war today is not only a dollar not spent on addressing the direct causes of climate change, but a reinvestment in more and worse wars in the future caused by climate change. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, quote, climate change sows seeds for conflict, but it also makes displacement much worse when it happens. In 2015, the DOD wrote a paper about climate-related security risks stating that it, quote, recognizes the reality of climate change and the significant risk it poses to US interests globally. The report went on to note that the impacts are already occurring and projected to increase over time. Climate change will, quote, aggravate existing problems such as poverty, social tensions, environmental degradation, ineffectual leadership, and weak political institutions that threaten domestic stability in a number of countries. The message that America needs to take away is that investing in climate change is an investment in national security. If unity can only be achieved by waging war, then let America have a war against global warming. It continues, and um, that was sort of something I wanted to talk about with other leaders um, from the military that could offer this unique perspective. And so I reached out to Colonel Wilkerson and Major General Leitch, um, asking them if they wanted to co-write a piece with me on this. And I wanted to get them on the byline as senior military officials who also have a perspective on this. And so we wrote that piece that was published in Yale Climate Connection uh, back in April. And the notion is that climate action groups have not been wildly effective at getting the sort of um, climate lukewarmers of the world worried or uh, concerned sufficiently relative to the amount of risk that we're facing. And I realized that when I talk about this with other people, and I talk about this in sort of the other peace action groups as well, a lot of groups want to focus on downstream policy solutions rather than just the upstream problem. And this is something we're working on at the Eisenhower Media Network. And what I mean by that is that a lot of people on the political spectrum can agree that the war in Afghanistan and Iraq have uh, been failed. They could agree that they've been extremely expensive, uh, you know, that they haven't produced any tangible results and that they're actually a net negative. The more we invest, the more is lost. Uh, but the problem is that once you go to the next step of where we might put that money instead, there's revolution because uh, lots of folks disagree. Some might say it should be tax cuts. Some others would say investment in something else, uh, government programs. And so if we start dividing our voice by going further and further to offering solutions rather than just agreeing on the problem at, and get majority voice on, on the problem, we can fight those second uh, policy battles later, but we can't even address them if we're doing it in a fragmented manner where everyone is suggesting different ideas for what should be done instead. We need to a group around the main problem uh, to, to go downstream. And I brainstormed this with Major General H and, and Colonel Wilkerson. And I mean, my take on this is that 
climate change as an issue can be spun lots of different ways. You're uh, hurting your children and grandchildren. 50% uh, of vertebrate species and biodiversity loss will be extinct by the end of the century. Uh, you know, there will be more national or natural disasters and superstorms. Those things are maybe compelling to a certain group of people, but there is still a group of people that is resistant to, to accepting that climate change is real. It is happening. It's happening now, and it needs to be addressed um, more as seriously as a mobilization for World War II, effectively. And my uh, approach is to try to change the narrative around climate change in the military specifically. You can, there's no doubt, like we can talk about the military as being one of the leading polluters of the world. That's uncontroversial. There's plenty of data to you know, point the finger at the military and wag it and say, you're very bad, you're a very large polluter. And the United States as a country is obviously cumulatively, and this was a point I was making in the book because yes, today uh, in, in 2022 figures, in absolute terms, China has more emissions than we do. But the thing that matters is the cumulative, scientifically cumulative matters because uh, carbon emissions are trapped in the atmosphere for thousands of years and they don't dissipate. So you, rather than measuring just this year, you want size under the curve of every year since the Industrial Revolution. And that's how you um, attribute um, responsibility and accountability. And the US is by far, by a country mile, the largest polluter. But when it comes to trying to activate that group, that resistant group that doesn't want to talk about uh, the climate crisis as a national security threat, we wanted to reframe it as it actually is extremely patriotic to take climate action. It is extremely patriotic um, to address this problem. And we do it in the sense of like, you're basically screwing the soldiers if you do not, because you do not want to try to provide national security in a three degree world. Providing national security in a three degree world would be far more expensive for the country. So again, removing all emotion, just talking in dollars and cents, it would be a lot harder to do it in, in a uh, three or four degree world. There would be more conflict. And if the US is uh, trying to be involved in these conflicts, there would be more of them and more uh, American children would be deployed for longer periods of time uh, to more unstable environments. And so maybe that is an argument that could resonate with folks. Uh, maybe a, an argument that it is a threat to our national security for physical bases. That if, if there's another climate book that came out uh, called When All Hell Breaks Loose, it came out in 2020 as well. And that was about climate change in the military. And they talk a lot about sort of the risks posed to military infrastructure. Um, and that would be sort of flooding of Air Force bases or Naval bases, storms that would interrupt operations and service, all of these sorts of things. Uh, so basically sort of expanding on, on that point as well, that if you want to keep a strong America in terms of defense of the national territory, that it is good to invest in climate change because these are going to affect our military preparedness. And so it's sort of taking a technocratic, like emotional appeal. So technocratic in the sense of like, this is affecting our preparedness as a military and as a country to defend itself, but also the emotional appeal of if uh, in this world with greater warming, more American soldiers will be sent to war. Do we want that as a country? And so that was trying to flip the narrative um, and, and, and try to use that as a tool uh, to sort of help encourage people to think about climate change and, and militarism in a different way. So that's sort of the main point I wanted to get across with that article. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, the one other quote that I had from my book, which summarizes some of my thinking, is that if the military is so myopic that it's only focusing on uh, combat uh, readiness and, and not climate change. And, and although they're sort of connected, it doesn't make much sense because 
how can you possibly keep the world safe for democracy or keep America safe in a more narrow ambit if you're not willing to do what is required to keep the world for safe for life on it? And that requires a, immediate action. And so that's the, that's the pitch. Happy to hear feedback from all of you. If I'm speaking to the progressive left, nobody gives a shit because that's, you know, a small, right. it's a, it's cool. Great. You're activating 10% of the voting base. <laughs> awesome. I mean, you need to activate more. So what is the argument that is going to hit moderates and hit uh, Republicans and, uh, you know, more centrist Democrats in a way that would change policy? And, and I think that that's why I'm trying to find arguments that work. And I'm hoping that uh, climate action as patriotism and putting the arguments forth is a positive message as opposed to a negative message, which is finger wagging that the military uses more petroleum than 140 countries on earth or whatever else. That doesn't move the needle, but saying that your children will go to more wars and we don't want to try to provide national security because it's so much more costly, might work. But um, I, I wish I had better answers, John. You ask a good question. What we're doing with the military, what missions we're sending them on. I have absolutely no problem. And, and like maybe this is um, not with the ethos of some peace action groups, but I think that probably many believe in national security and defense of the homeland. I would have no problem going back to Boston um, and fighting an armed invader that's coming in on boats to take over America. Like, don't have a problem with war in the sense of defending a homeland against an aggressor, but that is not what we as a country do. And it is not what our military is trained to do um, anymore. We don't do missions protecting DC uh, as practice. It's always some faux Middle Eastern uh, you know, village that is erected in Louisiana that it's an offensive mission, not a defensive mission. Um, so, I mean, basically, I went a little bit off the rails there, but uh, I, I, I hope that taking a tone of saying that there's actually some, some good to be had, that's okay. Um, but like, here are the risks and, and they, don't, they don't outweigh the costs. Or, sorry, the benefits don't outweigh the costs. Um, when it comes to climate change in the military, all hell breaking loose is probably the most recent and all encompassing uh, book that like tackles that, that angle. Um, it's honestly not the most exciting read to, to, to be real with you. That's, that's my perspective. And it's probably a lot of stuff that you have already had in your gut as knowing was true, but is elaborated quite a lot. Like, you know, for instance, uh, as we talked about sort of cost to decarbonize the American military, uh, impairments to military readiness due to extreme weather, flooding, and storms, uh, increased costs associated with having to do more military operations because of food scarcity in other countries that then breaks out in civil war. Uh, and so it, it sort of explores all of those uh, ways in which defense and climate overlap. Uh, but that's probably the, the best one I've found in that space. Before this, I did a quick search to find out what the Department of Defense is saying. And here's the quote. Uh, this is published, DOD preparing for climate change impacts, officials say, June 15th, 2022, by uh, a guy from DOD News. So, you know, insider. And, quote, climate change is dramatically increasing the demand for military operations and at the same time impacting our readiness and our ability to meet those demands while imposing unsustainable costs on the department, he said. To me, it, like, whenever I read anything about this, in the stages of action, the military is at stage awareness. Like, there is a, a awareness and they've gone to acknowledgement. So it's not like, oh, climate change is an issue. Uh, they've, they've proceeded at least to climate change is an issue and it's totally going to hit us pretty hard. I think in terms of like further downstream stages of like, and then spend a disproportionate amount of our budget actually 
uh, refitting bases, decarbonizing our vehicles. I, I don't, I, the military is a really slow moving thing. And if I were a military industrial complex executive, um, they have a perfect entry to spend, you know, billions and billions of dollars uh, for the future, because they'll say, we at Boeing and Lockheed Martin care about the environment. And that's why we are proposing a new fleet of vehicles, replacing the entire military fleet of vehicles that exist today, which are lower carbon. So please buy these instead. And that I would imagine is going to be um, the military's social impact approach uh, to trying to address their own emissions in, in, internally. So obviously you can retrofit buildings, you can do microgrids uh, to increase uh, basically like protection for the base in the sense that like if a large storm were to wipe out the grid, the microgrid uh, with solar panels and whatever else could create energy locally so that they would be insulated with battery storage and, and generation capacity to run the base basically without the grid. So there'll probably be billions of dollars spent buying a lot of microgrid and solar stuff so that when increasing numbers of natural disasters happen, the military bases still operate. That's not still not helpful for like the world in terms of uh, <laughs> like, they don't have an answer for how they can possibly do five times as many military conflicts per annum because climate change is creating civil war everywhere and food scarcity happens or water scarcity happens. I think that they're just completely unprepared for climate change in my, my perspective in reading these quotes. They know it's a thing. They know it's going to hit them. They know they need to spend more money doing stuff. But the size of the tidal wave that's going to hit the military in terms of um, how much damage climate change will do in terms of military preparedness is like a tsunami. And so it's like, great, you're building sandcastles, you're building some local small walls to sort of protect the military. But that's not fixing the underlying issue. So, I mean, the government needs to do broader stuff uh, and that gets into a larger discussion about carbon taxes and whatever else, but um, I won't go down that. The US as a country has a lot of work to do in terms of addressing its uh, carbon footprint. And historically, the burden that America as a country has placed on the rest of the world proportionately for all of the emissions that are in the atmosphere today, overwhelmingly falls on the shoulders of Americans. We've we've burned more and created more, um, and, and have therefore a larger share of responsibility for the climate crisis than other countries because we were responsible for it. Uh, so I think that like addressing America at, at large and what we can do about it is is more important than addressing the next level down, which is the military, which is also a very large emitter. And you know the largest consumer of petroleum. It's one of the largest emitters globally, more than like you know domestic um, emissions for Exxon Mobil uh, and, and things like that. There's umpteen examples of how the military uh, uses a, a tremendous amount of, of resources and, and burns a lot. So there's obviously both, and the military needs to figure out how they're going to reduce emissions, as you uh, rightly called out one of the best ways is to have fewer wars and to have fewer bases in foreign countries. But the real issue again is upstream. How can we address America as a country's um, emissions and what are we gonna do about it? And I, I don't know how seriously the White House is, is taking this, but other measures aside from strictly gross domestic product, um, you know, is, is this notion, uh, and this is something that was talked about when I was at grad school in Oxford, a decade ago, uh, but like the basically the natural capital, and it's to say like, you know, trees, water, everything else that we exist on that underpins existence as humankind has value. We should try to do our best to measure that and ensure that are the each of those different sort of things that under the natural assets are they growing or shrinking? And how much is climate change affecting each of those? Uh, and, and trying to basically create another uh, index of well being and health, in addition to just pure um, externality denying GDP. 
right. no worries. Okay, everyone, um, thank you so much, Eric, for joining with us and, and sharing your thoughts. Thank and you. I hope everyone, um, yes, if we can all kind of unmute and say thank you and, and wave or clap yeah. your hands or congratulate. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. I took notes. Thank I'm you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful that I was able to spend some time with all of you.